these times where all talk and no action is taking over the world, Varun is few of those people who cuts the crap and gets to the point. He is the founder of Apple and Banana, a UX research toolkit and guidance platform to help user researchers all around. He recently published a book of the same name. Apple and Banana sheds light on the practical ways we can make user research more efficient and fruitful. I'm your host, Sweekriti, and this is India's first user and UX research podcast, Core User to UX. Welcome to the show, Arun. It's really great to have you here. The kind of background you have, you have worked for some of the biggest corporations, Facebook, Best Buy. So working with these big companies brings a different kind of skill set that maybe smaller companies and startups can apply. So looking forward to that as well. Excited to be here. I would like to start with the venture of yours, your project. Like just like this podcast was my side project. <laughs> I don't know if I should call your call it your side project, but I would like to talk about Apple and Banana. And uh, can you talk a little bit about Apple and Banana? Because what it does and what it sounds like are totally different things. So it would be great if you talk a bit about it. Yeah. Uh, first off, nice to glad to be here. Excited to have our conversation today. Uh, Apple and Banana, for those that don't know, which is a lot of the world because we're small, uh, is our well, we Apple and Banana is essentially a company that we are excited to educate and energize the next wave of researchers. When I was at Facebook, I wished for something like Apple and Banana or Fruitful, the thing that we, the book that we just wrote and published uh, last month. It's only been a month. It's crazy. Um, it's about getting people excited about research, giving them structure, practical advice, not necessarily, hey, Facebook do does this, so you should follow it but recognizing why is it bigger companies do certain things or they address problems in certain ways that, are, that is much more transferable. And then we wanna make sure we bring that out. And the name Apple Banana is fun because we use characters to explain fun research concepts. So it's not just dry about validity or representativeness, which can get boring. We try to bring in characters to make it more fun, make it more storytelling, make it more dynamic. So that is something we've been working on since January 2018. and. The book has taken about two and a half years to, uh, all the way through, and we just published that. I really like how you emphasize on practical, because UX has definitely seen a lot of just talk, no show. It has It is becoming an influencer cult. Not cult, but an influencer zone, which is understandable because it's an up, up and coming field and many people are trying to get into it. It pays well. I really like your emphasis on practical. but. I would want you to elaborate on what practicality are you talking about? Is it methods, mindset, whatever that you harbor in this word called practical? For us at Apple Banana, practical and everything within the book, we consider practical to be a decision or a behavior that you can make or avoid making. So I can observe you and say, hey, you did not do that, right? The absence of said behavior, that's what we consider practical. There's a ton of UX content out there. And I agree with you, all these influencers, people posting multiple times a day. And I'm always like, you have innovative thoughts, game-changing thoughts every hour. Like maybe it's not as game-changing as you think it is. But for us, practical is just like, can I actually apply this? A lot of content says, consider this. I've considered it. My stakeholders still hate me. Like it doesn't help. I've considered these uh, ideas or they like to say, it depends. And then my brain always asks the follow-up question, what variables does it depend on? So when we're looking about practical, I always assume you work in a low maturity research culture where people are either avoidant or unaware or even resistant to research. You have struggles to get participants. You can't get maybe a thousand people for a survey or maybe you can't even get five good people for an interview or you don't have good budget, right? You can't actually scale. You can't do unmoderated. You can't think about quantitative. You can't think about different methods, maybe parallel. So you're running qualitative or something else is collecting data. So we think about that environment. So whenever we write something, it's what are the behaviors that someone can take and implement and customize to their environment or avoid doing when they struggle with stakeholder management, struggle with recruitment, and don't have a ton of tools. It's interesting. Like you're writing for the worst case scenario in some way. I want to challenge that. I want to challenge that because I don't know if it's the worst case. But I do think it's the majority case. 
if you look at LinkedIn, if you look at some of the mediums and the podcasts and the blogs, X research something at Google or Facebook or Netflix or whatever is always on these podcasts. Why? It gets attention. It gets viewers. I get that completely. But 99% of people doing UX research, design, writing, architecture, whatever, they work at not Facebooks, right? 99% of the people struggle with actual implementation. So you see this rise of like Google's doing this thing. I have no budget. Nobody knows who I am. I can't recruit. Our brand, our company's brand is so obscure, it's hard for us to get participation, let alone 10 people for a card sort or whatever, right? So I'm like, I don't know if it's the worst case, but I do know it is the majority case struggling to do UX sustainably and over time. That's an amazing point you brought up. I mean, after you said, I've realized that I'm so lucky to be in companies that have had the budget for research. I actually had this discussion in one of my previous episodes that, you know, research is a cost center, even though it helps us mitigate risk, Mm. effort optimization, stuff like that. But at the same time, it is a cost center. Like you have to reward participants if you're using a third party tool, the cost for that. And even if not that, like if you're doing in-person research, getting to those places, recruiting participants there, it's it's a game of uncertainty, high uncertainty. So I would really want you to elaborate on these practical things that you have discovered for yourself and for environments that do not have big budgets for research, that would be great. So I've gone ahead and listed out five. So the first one is to accelerate your research culture. It is my best, strongest advice and advice that I've seen work with some of the early stage startups I've worked with down to the Facebooks and the Best Buys. If you really wanna elevate research, you really have to think about running short-term, iterative, tactical, qualitative research focused on problems. Don't make it about buttons. Don't think, not necessarily usability testing is okay, but you'll find once they take your findings from your usability test, okay, thank you, we made the button blue. There is no need for new research, right? So you're really short, you position yourself down. And so that's not necessarily good. But if you're running short-term qualitative research, 10 interviews here, we're gonna go to two sites. We're gonna do something here. We're gonna said, let people send us voicemails about problems that we're hearing. It's like, that's qualitative, right? It's text-based. It, uh, you can probe into it after via email, whatever conversations you need to have, but focusing on iterative, short-term qualitative research, interviews, open card sorts, store and street intercepts, things like that, that will quickly help your stakeholders stop seeing research as just being like, oh, we answer questions. Two, it is a process of acting and learning together, structured learning. That's what you're selling. And qualitative research is great because it works with shorter budgets which means less participants, easier for you to manage for scheduling and recruitment. And the best part is you can get your stakeholders directly involved. This short iterative approach does make sense because when you're starting or implementing research methods in a company, like demonstrating your value becomes the you know survival game because if you don't demonstrate mm-hmm. then people will raise their eyebrows that okay why do we have research if we don't get answers so this short and iterative approach helps in demonstrating the quality of research and you're right you know usability tests can give answers but when there are more questions and there is more curiosity I guess that is good for the long term. It is also good for the implementation of the research processes in a company. So yeah, that does make sense. Can I add one point to usability testing really quickly? What I don't think people necessarily think about when you run any usability test anywhere, usability testing at its core, if you think about the practical side, it's very deductive. You set out to usability test something because your assumption is, This thing is usable. If you know it's usable, you will never test it. You will never spend the time for recruitment or a plan and get stakeholders excited. No, you're like, we believe this thing is usable. So we're going to go out and validate. And then you end up with a result. Yes, it is, or mostly, or no, it's not. So it's very deductive. It doesn't open up a whole bunch of new paths. It's just like, this thing, yeah, kind of worked or no, it didn't. And then after you're like, what do I need the researcher for? This thing kind of worked. I know it now. Thank you, UX. I'm going to continue on. So usability testing, good, but interlace that with other qualitative research that you're working on. Exactly. Because what usability test 
does even an ab test can do which is handled by product managers so they'll be like mm-hmm. okay i have the results why did i really do usability test my approach for usability test is that i do not believe that my product manager knows what he is doing or why did he make the feature in the first place to be really honest so i take a step back and try to have exploratory data on okay why did we do this and are we actually solving any problem or is it just mm-hmm. a feature that we have launched so yeah not taking anything for granted or with a pinch of salt that is in the researcher's blood and <laughs> at the same time this thing of you know okay i know now this works but there is this really important thing of replicability like is the mm-hmm. study replicable it is very important that the study is replicable because i read an article that you know most of the studies of social sciences cannot be replicated was it social sciences or psychology i need to recheck but same mm-hmm. goes for the usability tests and ab testing we do right the issue with replication i think it plagues all people facing science but i will say with qualitative research which is one of the tips right shorter term qualitative replication is actually very difficult because if you look at any people in time people are not static right they are constantly changing as a result of their experiences the things that happen the sense of the world they make so it's really hard for me to study you now qualitatively maybe ab test whatever and then test again and expect similar results so that's why you think about metrics right it's not roughly the same people but it's similar people and they all were able to sign up within 2 minutes or they all roughly said hey this is a very uh, from a thematic perspective this is very challenging so you can kind of see congruence like it's like similar but not the same the replication from a qualitative perspective is tough from a quantitative perspective people just don't care like if you talk to stakeholders they're like let's do a replication study we think we know this we tested some we iterated let's test again they're like why we've already done it we got a new thing we got to launch the holidays are coming in i'm having surgery my daughter's got this i got pto whatever they're like i don't care so the same issue that plagues replication in like academia is also in ux but it's like for a very different reason academia might not have a budget ux product folk they just don't care they're like eh we did it once at least and then the assumption is the prevailing assumption is some research is better than no research which is the dumbest like if you apply that to anything some cooking is better than no cooking well what if i'm cooking garbage like it doesn't make sense right but that's another completely different podcast uh, for another time yeah this qualitative point that you know this dynamism that is in human behavior and now that generations are cha- changing so fast that is a really good point thank you for bringing that up at the same time i brought the point of ab testing and replication because in ab testing even if there is like a change of 5% 4% we do not know if it's randomness or the button is actually working and yet we take it as you know it's the holy grail okay the ab tests have said that this is 2% better or 4% better some people like ab test google i believe is the one that really got or at least is known for ab testing like blue buttons versus red buttons and then they see lift they see conversion they see profit they see whatever the heck they want and i all i can think of is google has billions of people showing up every day across the planet they have so much data they have so rich with infrastructure to collect absorb and like disseminate data amongst themselves like you don't have a million people looking at one button you have a thousand so you to get like really statistically significant type results and then for that to actually mean something at scale a thousand people clicked red instead of 998 that's not that great of evidence your stakeholders aren't going to be excited and you also can't guarantee red it's going to work it barely works mm. so it's like ab testing is good if you have the traffic and the like type of response rate the ability to randomly assign things like that most people don't so don't ab test do usability testing throughout the process that would be more beneficial than ab testing but so with this i would like to move forward to your other points that yeah the next tip is around recruitment which is a huge issue uh number 1 batch recruit whenever you can what essentially that means is that you are focused for either the next month or x amount of time that you can allocate whatever your structure day to day looks like and your goal is to get to 30 participants as quickly as possible 30 informative participants not just 30 people from a coffee shop or 30 people from the library or whatever 30 people where you believe they are using the product 
They have the behavior that you might not might care about. They're informative for the questions and the topics and the things that you're trying to build or learn. Try to get to 30. Why 30? Uh, not necessarily from a math perspective, but it's a lot easier than a thousand, right? It's a lot easier for you to manage directly. If someone's not responding, you can reping them again. And the fact when you have 30 across a month, you can now use math in a much more effective way and make that 30 much more modular, okay? So with 30, you're like, okay, I can either run two tests of uh, two segments or two iterations of 15 usability tests, but maybe that expands all your 30. So you're like, no. So I will take, let's take 10, or let's take 12 of that 30. Now I can do four participants from three different segments, or I can do six participants at two different locations. And the math really starts to work out. It builds once again into that short-term qualitative and 30 is a lot easier for you to sell. And for budget, 30 times say 50 bucks right? That's not a ton of money. It's money. It's more than zero, but it's a little bit more palatable to tell your stakeholders that you need like 150, uh, 1500 bucks instead of like, I need 10,000 and research vendor and Qualtrics and yada, yada, yada. So batch recruit, try to get to 30 and that'll make it a lot easier for you to start to build your recruitment. So that's the last kind of part there. It's not a one-time thing, but it's like, once you figure out that 30, where do they come from? Where do they hang out? How do you validate that these people are actually informative? And they're not just people that said, I use Gmail. How do you know that they use Gmail or whatever? And so you also want to think about chain sampling, which I don't see a lot of people talking about. You got 30, right? Ask them. Thank you so much for participating in the study. We really appreciate your feedback. Here is your money or whatever, however you compensate. Is there anyone, before we wrap up, is there anyone in your personal network that you know uses Gmail and lives in Australia, whatever, that you feel comfortable connecting with us. And then either that person says yes, or they know someone, or they tell you, hey, check out Reddit, maybe you didn't check there. And if you want, what I've done really effectively is reward both people saying thank you for actually helping us. Because now they're like, maybe I know more people, they'll just send it to you. They're not necessarily participating over time. And then the other person gets paid and now it's like, it's a chain sampling. So very quickly, your network can increase. So batch recruit. Look to get to 30, be modular and mix match how you want to use that 30 and pay and look for chain sampling and compensate the person helping with chain sampling. So it helps you so much, especially with small stage startups trying to get recruitment and research a little bit more consistent or at least more predictable. But have you seen any drawbacks of chain sampling? It is a form of non-probability -prob or non-random sampling. Mm -hmm. So whoever you ask first definitely matters for who else you could learn from. That being said, it's not necessarily the only thing I would say, but you'd be surprised, especially if you had a positive qualitative research session with someone, a great survey or something on moderated, whatever you need to do, you will find that people are excited because they're like, I feel like inclusive. I feel like I'm being a part of this company. We have an upcoming handbook coming into Fruitful later talking about how, why people participate. A big reason that we have found is they like the sneak peek. They're like, what the heck is happening behind the covers? I want to be on the inside of the track. I don't want to be on the outside like everybody else. So you get the sense of like inclusiveness and not, I guess more exclusiveness. It's more exclusive to come in. And then you learn from different people. Is it perfect? No. But it can help when you don't have budget and you don't even know where the heck do I even look for somebody else. The minute you find one person, that person could lead to two, could lead to four. So that kind of thing. That's a very good point. So when I was going for job interviews, like I was asked that, you know, how do you decide which method or which recruitment pattern mm -hmm. is the best? And my answer was that, you know, I was working in a startup and at that point of time, Yes, it is important for what is the best, but it is also important what is the best in that situation because right. I have constraints. I mean, I would want to do focus groups. That would be good. But do I have the resources? Do I have that kind of target <laughs> pool? No, I don't. So, you know, this was a better choice at that point of time. And it was really hard to grab for people, you know, like, okay, but, you know, we should always go with the best. And I was like, that's a very narrow-sighted or very, I don't know, not even narrow-sighted, very idealistic and non-practical yeah. approach, especially for startups. For startups specifically, like a pseudo hack is the startup is going to die essentially if it does not generate revenue, right? So there's certain behaviors that you have to build for. So they click the button in a certain way and the company makes money or sales or ads or whatever the heck. If you can recruit within that specific product, service, feature, behavior, 
you will find that you're going to get meaningful representation from your participants. When I was at Facebook, we cared about a certain page loading or fast or not. Like how fast does this load? And so we're like, we can't ask you that question a week after you've used Facebook or as soon as you close the app or some other way. We have to trigger it. As soon as you open that page, we want to put up a little something. So we cognitively tested, work with an engineer to create a trigger point. And then when we recruit it, we knew confidently we would get a ton of sample size. There's only one question. And it was right at the point where we cared about the behavior. So we like worked together. So with Startup specifically, if people need to create an account or pay for the premium plan or something, can you work collaboratively, not just like force and bully and dictate your way, but can you work with your engineers and your designers to say, can I recruit here? We'll get the most participation, we'll get the highest response rates, and we'll get the most meaning out of that data. And then quickly, that's like, well, we know they're just bought because they just bought. And I'm excited now. I'm the CEO of a small company. I want to, why did they buy? <laughs> I'm excited now because I know what happened right before and right after. It's, they feel brought into the process. It's once again, not a perfect solution. None of these are perfect on their own. But when you start to like put them uh, together and mix and match, recruitment can become a little bit more predictable. That's the goal. Predictable recruitment, not necessarily a million people sign up for every state. Mm -hmm. I see that makes sense. I would like to go to the next point if you have. The next one is, is a mental perception, how you kind of think about research. And I was on another podcast and we were talking about research thinking, similar to design thinking, how research type thinking, how a researcher approaches a problem is a bit easier to democratize maybe than uh, research like skill set or structure. So one of the ideas is recognizing that you only have a finite number of time, no matter where you work, to conduct research. And the example that we write about in Fruitful is very simple. If it takes you, let's assume it takes you three weeks to run one study, okay? First week is to figure out what to study and maybe recruitment and write an interview plan. Next week is collecting data. So you're in interviews, maybe you're traveling, maybe a daily analysis or synthesis, whatever. Third week, you finish up your synthesis, you make a report and you present to that. So pretty straightforward, three weeks. Now, in one year, there's 52 weeks. And if it takes you three weeks to run one study, you could only run a maximum of 17, 17 chances to actually be impactful with your research. We put this idea very early in the book because the minute you recognize that, you're like, oh, it's not about saying yes. It's about saying no as much as I can. And on top of that, not just no, but being able to refine a boring or vague question. Do our users like blue dinosaurs? That's interesting. As a researcher, sure, I'm curious. But is that going to change the home page? Is that going to change the back button? Is that going to change the product strategy? No. Am I going to spend one of my 17 studying? Do people like blue dinosaurs? Probably not. So you have to get really good at recognizing, do I want to use this opportunity? Am I willing to spend one of my 17? If it takes you two weeks, you can run 26, right? So it's like it changes. But do you want to use it on this? If you don't, your job is to educate politely and say, hey, I love that you're excited about research. But let's talk about more, but let's get more value. Let's talk about new topics. Let's add more questions or let's scope down. Let's do something fast and iterative so we can make changes quickly. And then we can figure out, hey, where do we need to go next? So that is an important idea that I've seen junior researchers struggle with, but senior researchers use all of the time. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. So I shared this idea with my team that we need to be really brutal in how we choose but the thing is, like, you know, when research processes are being set up and I'm lucky to be part of very research positive organizations who saw the value in research once it was demonstrated. Yeah. And when you're that excited, you want to research everything. I mean, it's a very interesting position to be in because the stakeholders are excited. And mm -hmm. at the same time, that also means that because they're excited, they want to test everything. And, and at the same time, time you as a researcher also has, have to demonstrate that okay this is valuable i get exactly what you're saying like why well, i want to do research it's my product it's my area i'm excited this is going to help me uh data driven is good but data paralysis or data like requirements i would argue are not necessarily good they can be paralyzing you don't need to test everything you don't need to research everything you can <laughs> Do you have time? No, it's like as research is just to me, it's like a process of structured learning and discovery. Your stakeholders are already doing research right now. Where do we go to eat? What do I wear? What's the fastest way to get to this place? They're doing some sort of decision and ranking and looking at the world around them. Your company is likely hiring smart people 
and they are smart. So what I try to do in that case is ask two questions. One, uh, if we didn't do this research, would you ever reach your goal that you have, right? Your designer's goal is not to make the best design system. Now, it is, but are they going to hit profit goals for Q3? Will this research stop you from reaching that? And you'll find most people are like, eh. And then the follow-up question, do you have a pretty good idea of what to do? Yes, you're smart. We have other data. We have secondary data. We have blog, blog data. We can do something qualitative. We can do something unmoderated. We can partner up with marketing. Say we can do like a joint study there. We can so do so many other things instead of saying, you better stop and add this question and this question and this question. It leads you to getting burnt out. And it leads to such a small increase or uptick in value for them that they're like, okay, I could have done that myself. I could have learned it. Or like they'll say, I already kind of knew it. If you know it, <laughs> just do it. Like if it, I'm saying like, if you work in healthcare or you're dealing with like cancer and you're dealing with something like serious, do the due diligence. But 99% of the people I've talked to, they're not doing anything related to like that seriousness that they have to get it right. You are fine. You can test it. You can release it. You can pull it back after. Just let them know that you are smart and you already have a bunch of, if you've done this right, other research data that you can send and say, hey, there's corollary, there's adjacent learnings that can help you make smarter decisions. Instead of saying, I'm the bottleneck. I'm going to be the bad guy here. That is something I'm struggling with. Not struggling with, but it's a journey to get there, to, you know, to learn to say no. Even that's a journey as a human being. Yeah. I'm good at saying no as a researcher. As a human, well, uh, that's another conversation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's another rabbit hole. Very great points, Varun. We can talk about the next practical point. So this one is uh, stakeholder engagement is way more impactful than any fancy report, no matter how long or how nice your report is. So you have to think about closing the distance between the process of research and the perception of research. A lot of stakeholders, I need to learn this. Maybe, you know, maybe their questions are poorly defined. I know I need it next week or maybe not, right? These tentative timeline, timelines. And then they maybe see a report at the end and they maybe come to the teach out. Right, But think about you as the researcher going through this process. What to study? Where do I study? Does context matter? Can I get to the context? If it's COVID, can I be safe inside context? How many people? How do I know how many enough people? Who was the most informative participant? We talk about that. The MIP, who is the most informative participant or person to hold the most information about our research questions? Most times, I just stakeholders say research, users. Users last week, users last month, left-handed users in Argentina, or they lived in Argentina once. So many different ways to think about it, that. Then you have to collect data, prep for it, analyze it, and then eventually report it. You've gone through an entire mountain of micro decisions and stress and work, and your stakeholders are like, here's like a 30-page report. So they are not getting the full value. So if you think about closing the distance, when you're aligning, can you have them do a question ideation session? I love doing that with stakeholders. We're going to research, we're going to come together for 30 minutes. I want you to write any question you want. Your goal is specifically for volume, not for quality, just a ton of questions. Let's whittle them down together, see what's actually important. When you think about recruitment, hey, I've got a list of 100 people who've signed up for interviews. Can you come with me? Take a look at this list. Start. Who do you think it sounds really exciting? Who would make you excited to show up? Who would you want to come take notes for? Who do you think another person needs to be involved, right? That kind of stuff. Collecting data, take notes, pretty straightforward. I like having a research Slack channel whenever I'm doing qualitative sessions so they can ping me really quickly. I have that open on a second monitor. I can say, that's a great point. And what about this? And I can really kind of be flexible in research instead of saying, hey, my plan is done. We'll have to do it in the next one. And then same thing for analysis. A great thing uh, that I've really found to be very effective and approachable. If you've run 10 interviews, select three of the best interviews that are the most information not necessarily the most sensational, but like, whoa, we wanted to learn about X. These three people are really talking about X. And then sit down with stakeholders and say, we're going to put together maybe 30 minutes. I want you to read through all of them, take notes. And I always ask for two post-its. On one post-it, write down everything you found from all three that's super interesting. We'll talk about why. Then the other one, think about what's confusing or contradicting, right? Oh, that challenges the data that we have, or that challenges what I believe. We can have a conversation at the end. And then quickly, they're going to recognize two things. One especially with qualitative data analysis, that's hard. Sitting there, looking at words, trying to find meaning, and they're only doing three, you're doing 10. So that's one. And the second thing is they're like, whoa, there's a ton here. It's not just a quote. It's not just a slide deck. 
but it's people talking about real experiences and emotions and behaviors that they're like, I actually care about this. So then I quickly, and then same thing with the reporting, when you are reporting, if you do get even one stakeholder, half in, like included and half engaged, Thank you so much. We're going to get started with our presentation. I just want to say a quick thank you to John. He helped us figure out 10 people to recruit from a batch of 100. I really appreciated that. We had a really great ton of insights. Thank you, John, for being included, right? Being engaged. And if you can take a picture of John doing something and put that when you're presenting, the amount of times I've done this and it works, why is Bill there? How does he get to be? I want to be involved. And then they'd act like little kids. And like, I want to be involved. I want to be in the next one. And they've sold themselves. And it's not negative, it's not coercive, it's not like dark patterns or like mental like Jedi Knight mind tricks. It's just like, why is he involved? I don't know I could be involved. He looks like he's having fun. And now he gets to do this presentation. He's learned before I did. So essentially discovered fire before me in this report. Now I want to get involved. So the tip really is, it's like the entire process you are going through so much, don't go through it alone. Come up with little hacks to bring people into the process. And very quickly, they're like, this is fun. This is engaging. I'm learning a ton. And they're like, I want to do this again. Because next time, I want to do it better. I want to talk to 100 people. I want to do whatever. Then it's like, that's another battle. But get them involved. Varun, this stakeholder engagement thing has been a big learning curve for me as a UX researcher. Initially, when I came, I just thought that, you know, I advocate for the users. Users are my priority. And then I was like... No, 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 that's not the case. I have to speak the stakeholders' language and they are the ones giving me money, not my users. <laughs> so I am, yeah, I am the channel between the users and the stakeholders. Then after I learned that, then I was like, you know what? My product managers are so busy. I am the one who should be doing everything silently, working hard mm -hmm. and then just presenting the report and then bam, and even that did not work well because what happened a lot of times, there were so many communication gaps that I wasn't able to identify. And then the mm. result would be different from what they expected or what they had in mind. Or in fact, it had changed over the period of time I was executing and <laughs> analyzing the research. And I was like, what the hell is happening? Because I came from a mindset that, you know, I do not want to have a meeting for everything. If I can do it on text, you know, that would be great. And I still believe in that. But at the same time, I don't know if it's the corporate DNA. Until and unless there is a meeting, people don't take it seriously. Right. <laughs> so these things actually make you learn that, okay, stakeholder engagement, that is a mammoth in itself. And you have to understand the nuances of it because learning the language of your stakeholders and their mindset is an internal research that we as researchers do all the time. The, the things you're talking about, my brain, the listeners can't see my face, but I was like, uh, cause it's such a true idea of like, no one wants it. No one wants to help, but they want it. They're like, I want this. And then two weeks later, they're like, I never wanted that. I wanted this thing instead. You're like, I've already done this. Now you're saying it's useless. And it's like, it's such, a plight in this space because it's like you know you can ask for anything and this person will this human being named a ux researcher will go out and try their best and then you're like ah that sucks i don't care about that i was i don't know i never asked for that and all i can think is is like it's such a tough issue this is another reason why i say short-term qualitative research especially if you can do it with something i call a break point if you have 12 participants for interviews you consciously set a stakeholder in person as much like not necessarily face uh, face to face, not necessarily on site. So after the first six, you are gonna regroup. Here's what we're learning high level. Here's what we're seeing high level coming out of this. Here's the emergent patterns. We're gonna dig deeper. Are we on track? And every time they're like, yes, that's kind of good. And then in the week that you've done those interviews, they're like, hey, I wanna add this. Great, we're gonna pivot right now for the remaining six. We're gonna go even deeper with them. And then suddenly they're like, research is flexible. It is modular. Because it can be, because you have the right to change and flex. But this issue of like, I want it. I don't want it anymore. I hate it so much. It's happened to me. And I'm, I'm not sure it's going to go away. But I think, I think it'll happen less as I figure out other strategies to get people involved and other ways to maximize my time. But for all the junior listeners, stakeholders, researchers listening, stay, you have two sets of users. You have your user, the person you care about, this human being. And then you have this other human being 
who also cares about this person, but in a very different way. Mm-hmm. And it's like the stakeholder is a very much a part. I think of us as like a bridge or a channel or like a translation type device. They stakeholder wants to talk to user. They don't speak that language. User will never get a chance to talk to stakeholder because there's a senior product director at Google. They don't have time for this. So you sit in between and you try to facilitate kind of conversation and like patterns that way. But stakeholders, this is stakeholder management is another course. It's another book. It's another three hour podcast to be sure. Absolutely. So thank you for bringing that point up. I would like to go on the next point. This is the last one that I have. Uh, they're just put together five just to, for the sake of time. The last one is avoid surveys if you can't design them collaboratively with your stakeholders, if you can't cognitive and pilot test them, and you can't get a meaningful sample size. So work backwards, meaningful sample size. It's not necessarily using like a sample size calculator. A lot of people use those. They're great. They are helpful. They're based on complex math. But the math that they're based on top of is using random sampling or probability-based sampling. So you know the chance of selecting any one person from this possible X number of participants, you know the percentage. It's one out of 1,000, one out of 10,000, whatever. Most people, especially if you're not at a Google or a Facebook, you are using non-probability-based sampling. You don't know the chances of selecting someone or how many people there are to even select. So if you use that sample size calculator, you're getting a misleading sense of confidence. And then it says, talk to 370 people. If your population is really big and your margin of error gives you like plus or minus like 5% or whatever it is. And it's like, no, that only works if you can use that kind of sampling. So don't use that. The other way to do it for sample size meaningfully, talk to your stakeholders. We're going to talk to, we're going to look at uh, a thousand respondents. How do you feel about that? They're like, that sounds great. They are not interested in the math. They're just interested in some amount of data to make smarter decisions. The middle part is before you launch your survey, you have to do it collaboratively. What do your stakeholders want to know? Spend a lot of time maybe uh, drafting question topics. Don't thought, don't draft survey questions because you'll spend a ton of time wording and rewording and now legal has to see this. No, what are the things that we believe to be true? What are the topics that we care about? From there, you can work on these are the topics that are more interesting and prioritize them, put the more interesting ones on top, assuming people leave, and then from there, you work on writing tro- like less questions for the relative topics that you have. Keep it to no more than two to four topics, maybe three to four questions per topic. A good benchmark I like is 15 questions or 15 to 16, short enough for you to actually get out the door collaboratively, but long enough to start looking at multiple layers of patterns between demographics or whatever other variables you want. And then the middle part is cognitive and pilot testing. A survey is unmoderated unless you're doing it in person, which most people are not, uh, you don't know why someone clicked what they did. You know they clicked strongly disagree. Unless you explicitly ask, ask after every next question, you click strong, strongly disagree. Why did you do that? No one's going to take your survey. It's going to have a horrible response rate. But you know they clicked strongly disagree. Why did they do that? Ask them how do they interpret that question? Could this question be reworded to make it easier? How would they answer the question out loud without the options so we can understand, is there a, a congruence between what we believe we're asking and the responses they can give, that kind of stuff. And then also pilot test it. Some people never, some researchers never do this and stakeholders do. They're like, we're gonna launch a survey. Do you know it works on a mobile phone? Oh, it doesn't. I have tested something and I'm like, it does not work in the store where we need it to work because the security protocols at the store is saying this is spam and then it's contacting the manager that this is spam, that now this manager has to take come and maybe clear out some data. And we're like, that's not going to work. No employee is going to be able to give that feedback. So pilot test it. Can the person who needs to be able to use it and complete it, can they complete in that exact format? If they can't, rework everything. So be collaborative with stakeholders looking at question topics. Cognitive test. Ask people to walk through the survey out loud and talk about what is this question asking you? How would you answer it? Pilot test it all the way through to see what the process is all the way down and then look at the data that comes back and then look for a meaningful sample size. If you can use random sampling, use random sampling. It will save you a ton. If you can't, your goal is to look for a meaningful sample size that can be done within your time frame, within your constraints and something large enough that your stakeholders are like, great, it looks like a good use of survey data. Not just eight people, we get 800. 800 people is way more than eight. That sounds pretty good to me. That sounds quantitative. I can go from there. It's not perfect. None of this advice is like picture perfect, 
but it does explain how research is a little bit more, you should be more forgiving for research. It is the process of learning. It is not that we got 8 million people to take the worst, most biased survey in the world. So surveys, for me, they have worked wonders because it helped me in triangulation when I started out. Mm -hmm. Before that, we were doing qualitative interviews with like five to six people. But as soon as I introduced surveys, it became a whole different game. And stakeholders were more interested in the data because PM liked to hear numbers. So that was there. But the thing is, in my case, like the kind of environment I worked in, I can never imagine putting out a 15 question survey or a questionnaire. Because Mm -hmm. in that scenario, my respondents were so less. After some point of time, I had given up on emails. I'm not Mm -hmm. going to send surveys on emails. And then what was left was product surveys. So it was inside the product. And that, like taking it above five, you know, you were very wary of, okay, should I take it above five because you're doing it in the product. But in that case, the respondents were quite a few, like reliable number. Do you have experience with such things, such surveys? So a couple things there. Uh, Number one, common issue, common issue for someone to find themselves in. Number two, uh, triangulation is good, but think about other forms of triangulation that's not necessarily another method. You can look at data triangulation. Is there another data source, location triangulation? You want to go to another place and see if you can corroborate. A great one is a researcher triangulation, somebody else, someone else with a whole different set of skill set, background, whatever, maybe someone even newer to the project. So they had more objective, quote unquote, fresh eyes. That can be helpful to also triangulate. The third thing is like, why do your stakeholders believe numbers are perfect? Survey data is flawed all the way through. Research data is flawed all the way through. It's not perfect. It is a good approximation of what we believe to be true and the things that we want to learn. But why surveys? Why more numbers? Why is more and more better? That is another conversation to be had. If you're doing product surveys, can you think about now a product like a micro survey roadmap? So you're only asking three questions here. You're asking two questions here, one question here, and you can start to build that process. So there's that. And if you're thinking about surveys, there's a ton of ways to make survey design or the content or the format, not the content, easier. We're going to have three questions on this page and have three questions of three pages. We're going to have six questions on this one and then one question on the next to really maximize focus and laser people like, well, it's only one question. I can click it. So there's multiple strategies that you can try to figure out what's the best. So it's a common situation. There's not someone on this podcast could be like, that doesn't work for me. You're right. This is general advice and you only deal in specific situations. I will be wrong because that is the definition of general advice. (laughs) That being said, it's like there are ways to try to be creative in how you're solving this problem. And at the end of the day, if you the survey doesn't work, it doesn't work. Just look at other methods that you can try and see if you can build survey design or a branch in your research capability to do better survey design after you've built more credibility, more goodwill. A lot of stakeholders are not data literate, but they're data like overwhelmed. I got roadmap here and a dashboard here and an email here and a market report, yada, yada. And it's like, cool. How are they making sense? All of that data is a signal. How are they making sense of the future? So that is, a, I would argue, a much more fruitful question of we're going to be collecting data, qualitative, quantitative, whatever. How are we going to use that to make better decisions? What do you need to see? What do you want to avoid to see? What do you expect to see? All those kind of other questions can really make it a little bit easier to navigate out of the situation. Again, I guess you have brought this point up the second time, something around data paralysis that we have so much data and you have worked in a very data heavy organization, which if I think deeper is a curse (laughs) because (laughs) someone who gets anxious and, you know, is looking for every kind of data being in an environment with so much data can actually be paralyzing and overwhelming for me. And, you know, (laughs) learning to draw the lines, learning to draw the boundaries is a process and a learning in itself. I have talked about triangulation in my previous episodes as well. So as soon as triangulation comes in, I do not like to call myself just a qualitative researcher because I am applying different methods and I am not sure if my next method is going to be qual or quant. There is one story that I remind myself and a lot about research I have learned from stock markets and you know how to investors and speculators invest so there was this gentleman i don't remember his name who made a lot of money 
trading in green lumber so mm. that's like the fresh lumber uh, that is just cut and he made tons of money but in one day in the trading pit he asks his coworker i don't know why people pay so much for lumber that is painted green so like with so much data he had he did not know that green lumber is actually the lumber that is freshly cut and the other traders are like he's joking right that helps me understand that not every data point is important to make money it's such an interesting story and that helps me deal with my data paralysis when i'm like okay this data is important this incident is important this helps me keep check that maybe focus here for a while and see what is actually important and try to draw lines here that was fantastic i appreciate that i will add one thing to it even at facebook where everything under the sun the uh, perception is everything under the sun is being measured but the amount of times we wanted to see something we didn't have it i'm like yeah the data measures what it was told to measure our context our position here in this problem space is constantly evolving people are leaving people are coming we're reacting to market forces we only measure what we think and know to measure so it's like even if you had all of the data which i objectively would agree i was very much having all of the data there are more than enough instances where like we don't have that and then you feel kind of dumb we're measuring everything else we're measuring some things it's like you can't measure everything so that is like partner up with like data scientists or other marketers or maybe even HR finance and you can triangulate and like build relationships but pursuit of more data I'm like that's just a fool's errand being able to specify of the trillion data points these 10 are specific that to me is where research really becomes so helpful so powerful and I will say this though I just bought lumber I got to see if it was colored I got to see if somebody I'm joking but man it was good I like that joke. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember the gentleman's name but if anyone's interested the name of the book is What I Learned Losing a Million Dollars and that is where the writer shares the story. <laughs> BR BRB I'm going to go change the title of our book. That's a pretty that's a good title. Yeah, it is. And a great book. So, yeah. Coming back to UX research in our last introduction for you were very much keen and interested on the benefits of writing that you discovered as a researcher first i had the mindset that you know whatever is coming to my mind i'll just type it out but i don't know if it's a habit or what now i want to write it down first and it's much more fluid the process like it comes and i just pen it down and then i go to my laptop I was never this kind of person to be honest. I'm not at the stage where I can say that you know these are the benefits of writing. I I really don't know at this point of time. I haven't discovered. But uh, since you have discovered it or you know just from your experience, how has writing helped you as a researcher? Honestly, it's been fantastic to write even before the book, even before Apple Banana. I was always writing about research for myself because that I found to be the a great equalizer a great accelerator in some ways um just you think you know stuff right your stakeholder says some bs and you're like man that's a bad idea and then i used to be like man that's a bad idea and then never think about it again i'm just like dumb stakeholder not a good position i'll agree i've evolved but now it's like that's a man that's a bad idea my brain is like why and i'm like oh okay why why do i think that is a bad idea and then that once again of going back to practical I know it's a bad idea for X and Y's reasons. How do I get out of the situation, right? How do I give myself a jetpack? So writing just forces you to write confront what do you actually know? So when I was first writing the book, I was like I know I need to cover recruitment, qualitative and quantitative research, on top of that qualitative data analysis, quantitative data analysis and reporting, all these other ideas and I was just like, okay, I'm going to make a little big spreadsheet. Uh and I was like I'm just going to fill in what I knew. And I knew stuff and then I was like how do I know this? right and that's when like the questions and like what do i know right should uh, imposter syndrome with writing uh, definitely happened for me but it just really forces you to think about what it is that you know you think about how transferable some of your knowledge is this thing worked yeah at facebook i don't work here anymore it's not going to work for somebody else and it's like okay so what is true about the situation i've spent a lot of time looking at like generalizable principles from writing and i can only have gotten that through the process of writing and engaging with my thinking There's an absolutely fantastic YouTube uh video The Art of Writing Effectively by Larry McInerney 
who is, I believe, or still is, I'm not sure, this video is a few years old, the writing director at the University of Chicago. And he talks about how writing, especially in our craft, it's not writing for writing or for communication a ton. It's really writing to help yourself think, right? You're thinking through your thoughts and writing is possibly the best, if not only way to communicate to yourself what it is that you know. And as a researcher, I'm concerned with truth. I'm concerned with how do I know that? How do I know good versus bad evidence versus really great and kind of good, right? Those kinds of like gray areas. Writing definitely exposed that. Like you don't know that as well as I, I would like to. You don't know that as well as you think that you do. And on top of that, for me, for the book at least, teaching somebody else, that's not an effective way to teach somebody. Step one, here's how you do a backflip. Step one, do a backflip. You're like, that's not good advice. How do I break that down? That kind of thinking. So writing it's such a intimate process. I was not writing like even before the book, I was writing every day just for myself, just to kind of keep track. And that has helped. And I've told other researchers, especially new people, write about what it is that you're doing, especially if you're coming out of a boot camp or you're going into one, you're trying to transition from wherever, you're doing something every day. I'm gonna okay, I'm gonna do this, use a five person usability test. Here's what I think will be true. Here's how I'm gonna structure it. Here's what happened after. Here's how I analyze the data. The concept of reflexivity is very important in qualitative research. It's the idea of being aware and reflecting on my place in this research. How do I influence the results? How do I bias them? Why am I focusing on this data versus that data? Only happens through writing. So there's a lot of people doing qualitative research, but they might not think about their position or their place in said qualitative research, but they're amazing and they're great, sure, but you can evolve. You can become a significantly better researcher writing and engaging with your thoughts. I have mentioned in my previous episodes that UX research or research is a very introspective field and that's what I like about it. And that is where the role of writing fits very perfectly. As you said, it helps us dig deeper and understand our own psyche, which is very important. I mean, all those studies and everything. But if you don't have time for that, if you can't make time for that, then I really think that being a researcher is not the path for you then. Yeah, that's a very strong statement to say, but yeah. Maybe not yet. <laughs> Maybe eventually through practice and through... Um, there's two things on, on top of writing. There's something that I call an analysis journal, which is something I create for every study. Uh, what am I doing as I'm going through analysis? And at the top of it is always like a reflexivity section. How did I bias this? What is my relationship to the topic? What is my relationship to the demographics or the psychographics of the people I'm talking to? I'm a male. I identify as male. I live in America. I'm an immigrant. These people are women. They don't aren't immigrants. They identify with this. What does that relationship look like? And I keep track of it. And it really helps you be like, okay, what is happening? It's a very conscious, like intentional process. Then the other part of writing, a lot of researchers get burnt out or they leave for better, greener pastures, bigger company, more money, whatever. And they don't track all their, like the impact. So I always make to have an impact journal. And it's always only two columns so because I want to use it. I don't want it to make homework. First column is the date something happened. And the next entry is the thing I want to record. And it's small. It's never like I changed the company. I've never heard of one research study changing the company. Me personally, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. But it's like date, March 1st, I got three participants instead of two. That is a win. And people don't think to record that in the process of writing how she codified that. You look back after six months, okay, we got three, then we got seven, and then we got two stakeholders involved. We onboarded Qualtrics. That was awesome. It really opens up all of our other possibilities. Then we did this, and we did field research, yada, yada, yada. So that process of writing for yourself to keep track of your own wins just for you, and you can maybe put bucketize, 15% increase in sales based on research, that kind of stuff. That's good, but we're looking at you just as you as a person. Those kind of little moments, they go. they don't go in the portfolio. They don't show up in the resume. They not, they don't show up on LinkedIn. They maybe show up on a podcast, but it's really for you to be like, I have done stuff here. I have slowly adopted the behavior and the mindsets of how my stakeholders and this company builds for real people. And you got to make sure to write that down. Maybe write it, droodle it, whatever. But having an impact journal and like analysis journal with reflexivity, simple things. Once again, simple behaviors that anyone, Facebook or the startup down the street can look to adopt and be like, I am more engaged. I am becoming a better researcher through this investment of writing. Yeah, absolutely. You 
mentioned that you have your journal for analysis process i'm really glad you brought that up because analysis at least for me is like a very secluding process i'm like i have to go in a bat cave and look through data and my teams is on dnd do not disturb me right now i'm analyzing <laughs> stuff like that do you have any practical learnings for analysis you know analysis in itself it's the invisible core which is holding everything together and i feel that you have also mentioned this in our introductory call that data is nothing without interpretation but are we even doing that interpretation right my company works with many third party research organizations but at the back of my head i'm always like okay how did they come to this what are they analyzing yeah. even when they're using percentage i'm very curious about what is the denominator here like yeah. what is this percentage about like are they just fooling me or what is it so anything yeah. about the analysis your learnings or any practical discoveries so for me this is where i get a little philosophical so get ready listeners not a ton <laughs> But if you look at analysis, what, we're, what are we trying to do? We're trying to find patterns. Why do we care about patterns? We want to build better. And what do we care about? We care about truth, essentially, right? How do we know this is true? How do we know this 80% is actually representing what it is that you're implying, right? It depends on what kind of research, though. Truth is position in the type of research that you're doing. Qualitative thinks about constructivism. Truth is constructive. You can only interpret and understand human experiences, their relationship with the product, how they make it feel, that kind of stuff through interpretation and it's constructed meaning. You can't observe it. Whereas quantitative looks at something more to be more realism. The truth is out there, I will just have to discover it. It exists independent, the truth about people, the rules, the social rules that could keep people together, how they behave. That's out there, I'm just gonna go discover it. So truth, it depends how are you putting it together. I like, and we wrote the entire fruitful book from an abductive or a pragmatic research philosophy where we're doing the best we can we give the most tentative explanation for truth based on incomplete, but more meaningful and relative, uh, relevant data. It's not perfect because research, especially UX research is an applied science. You're only right up until more better data comes along. So you're technically always wrong, waiting for better data. And I always like to tell my stakeholders, this is the best possible estimate. This is the closest we can get to what we care about. And so through that process of analysis, it can be secluded. I'm not going to disagree. If you've got 30 interviews, good luck. That's going to take you a significant amount of time to even structure, to code, to clean. That being said, analysis to me is a part of like breaking it apart. So instead of my stakeholders not being coding every line, can you tell me what I'm supposed to be looking out for? Can I just double check the research questions? I'm seeing this thing very early. Do you think I should drill deeper into that? Data is all there. You collected it. But maybe after you've learned, maybe your stakeholders are like, we don't care about that anymore. It's like, fine, great. I'm going to put this to the side and focus more on this. So it can be a collaborative type process. And in my analysis journal, if it's quantitative, like a survey, I know very quickly what I'm going to write, what, my, what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to clean this. I'm going to look at very, very relationships between this demographic variable and this behavior, and then this demographic variable in this context or whatever, and I can write that down. It keeps me organized. It keeps me aligned. And the minute my survey is done collecting, and I like to cheat a little bit and start analyzing the data after the first day of a survey, because it's all independent, and your respondent on day one does not influence and should not influence respondents on day three, I start my analysis. And then from there. It's working. I need to go deeper. I'm looking at emergent patterns. I'm seeing something unexpected. So it's a very much a process. So is it secluding? Yes. Can you make it more in collaborative? Yes. But through my analysis journal, I'm in a dialogue with me about the data. So I never feel like I'm alone. I'm like, I'm seeing this. What is my brain seeing? What is it seeing implicitly like that gut feeling? What am I seeing when I graph it or visualize it? That kind of stuff. So it's like the analysis journal keeps me focused. I want to get stakeholders involved. I Like I was saying, pull a little bit of data, code with them. That can be fun. Post-session, right after a session, do a little bit of analysis or a debrief that can help decrease your time, um, that kind of stuff. But it is, I would argue, like a single phase of research that is best left to let you breathe uh, through the research process. Sit down with your data meaningfully, understand the stories and make sense of it for you. But I do think it's a good slowdown. So when you speed back up to report, you really understand you're intimate with your data. Tell me about this. Oh, I know the quote. I did. I was there. I collected the data. I sat with it meaningfully. I put it together. Yeah, that's what they said. They live in Vermont and they buy 
horses or whatever the heck it is. And you're able to speak very confidently. So yes, secluding, but also really in energizing if you take the time to like really try to understand what you have. Yeah. Analysis can be two poles at one time you are feeling exhausted, especially when I'm summarizing and doing the dog work. But when the patterns emerge, it is rejuvenating in a very inexplicable way. So, yeah. Can I ask a follow-up question? When you're talking about analysis, is there like a specific example that you're like, man, this particular study or this particular analysis was really challenging or stressful? Is there anything that comes to mind? Because I feel the viewers at home can't see you, but you're like thinking about something. I would love to know, is there a specific example? So in qualitative interviews and analysis, when I'm re-watching the videos and just, you know, breaking the interviews down for maybe affinity mapping, or if I'm doing usability test to gather all the critical incidents, stuff like that. So that is exhausting, even though it's very mm -hmm. important part to break it down, but dissection can be exhausting. Can I ask when you start analyzing in your research process? So the thing is, when I'm taking interviews, when two, three interviews, my brain automatically starts to map out the patterns in the sense I get some sense or some inklings because humans are anyway very great at seeing patterns rather than divergences mm -hmm. like we love to see patterns even if they're not so that's one thing we have to be wary about so subconsciously that start to emerge then there is documentation and i have to show things so i mean it starts and especially in affinity mapping you know i can start seeing patterns in three interviews like if i've taken three i can start it then for the next set i'll take it and then start adding it to my affinity mapping and see if there is an any new information that is coming out and stuff like that i try not to do all of my analysis at one time because then it's very repetitive it's very redundant especially with qualitative research quantitative I'm using R, I'm using Excel, I'm using Google Sheets, I'm using whatever the heck tools that I have available. I can clean it faster, I can visualize it a lot easier. But with qualitative research, I make it a huge like goal, like a required goal. At the end of the day, all the collected data I've had today, it has to be cleaned and it has to go into my primary data analysis structure. So if it's going to be participants in the code column here, whatever the heck I need, it has to be in there. And then on top of that, I do something called voice summaries or the concept of um, uh, note take uh, memoing or qualitative memos is a process of like reflecting after each session or during that day. I don't want to write. I've been writing all day. Mm -hmm. I've been typing all day and trying to say, hi, Bob, tell me about this. And be before I'm very exhausted. I do voice summaries. I just talk to myself about the data. And then when I go to analysis, I just listen to, if I've got three days worth I've listened to three. They're each like three minutes long. And I'm making very sure to call out participant eight. Tell me, I want to dig deeper into this. What do they mean by this? Can I see that? Are they talking about this other thing? That kind of stuff. It gives me things to look out for. So I'm, and then I write that in my analysis journal. So I'm getting myself kind of excited to do discovery and dig deeper. And so the voice summary super helps. And if you do it in a professional way, the date, the time, location, whatever matters, you can share those out. And I share those out frequently as like little highlights. We wrapped up five day, five interviews this morning. I want to go ahead and send this out. It's three minutes. I bet stakeholders tell me they'll wait to listen on their commute home back in the pre-COVID time. Because it gets fun, like a little podcast. But I know all the characters. <laughs> and I know and I care about what's happening. And it's such a fun way. And then they tell me, tell me more about this. Once again, in my analysis show, I need to go back and look at, does this thing match with this other thing? And I just have that in my head. And so... It's, it's the tough part of the job, especially qualitative coding. The more you code, the faster you get. And the longer you stay at one company, this is something I did not realize when I first came in, the longer I stayed at Best Buy, the faster I was able to code. I started to see recurring patterns and different topics and this thing touches that. I'm like, oh, I can see that. My first day, everything stood out. I was like, this is amazing, how many codes? And it's like, Moving forward, so I know my team, I know the context, I know the metrics, I know the business goal, I know the segment because I've worked with them, I can code so much faster. So that's not a life hack as much as a time hack. Like if you spend time with a certain population, you'll just be able to code faster at least. The voice memo thing sounds interesting because it is like a way to record my subconscious thoughts and the how my brain is thinking. And then going back to it is... Like, sounds interesting. I think I can give it a try. So thank you for bringing that up.
coming to our last question um this is something again we discussed in the intro call and that was a very fresh and hearing it for the first time that how research speeds up processes how important is research in a startup and how do they make it more effective because as i said research is a cost center in fact i mean if my pm is making a decision right now now they have to wait for like 2 to 3 weeks to see the validity of their idea or their decision <laughs> in some cases so where was the slang coming from that you know research speeds up processes and how can i implement that in a startup environment with the cost center i always think about like cost of paying participants they're always like oh pay them just give them a $25 gift card and it's like you would never get out of bed for a $25 gift card why would this person who we care about trying to get their money trying to help right why would they get out of bed for a $25 gift card but it's like if you would have to give 10 people 50 bucks for an interview it's 500 that is significantly cheaper than hiring a senior engineer who's building a product that nobody wants <laughs> like the math does not compute I can either get a scrape or I can chop off my leg and you're like the math doesn't work. And when I talk about processes it's like st especially startups they're excited to build they need to be building stuff they need to be releasing they need to think about their runway they need to think about like what does next month look like and next year and funding all these questions. Uh research is possibly the most efficient way to optimize your limited resources. What do we care about? What is important? What can we build? What do they want? What do they define as success? All these kinds of questions It's not that marketing can't or HR or whoever can't. It's that as a researcher, UX researcher, your skills are very geared toward this possible area of great impact. We should be building these things. This is how they define success. Did you know they use this in low Wi-Fi areas? And it's like, oh, now we've identified different, more impactful ways to actually serve and move faster. So the roadmap that any startup has, it never stays the same because you start doing research and you're like, why are we building this crap? And the best startups, this is very much a business or leadership type strategy they know they're only going to win if they are very specific and finite with what they're trying to do we make b2b saas marketing easier can i order pizza you cannot order pizza through the app because we've specifically said we do b2b saas software as a service marketing that's all we do research helps you figure out what those boundaries are right that kind of idea we know more so we can actually move faster if you think about doing research that's designed to be impactful how will we use this data once we've collected said data how are we going to maximize our limited opportunities to learn from the people we want to help how are we going to get as close to them and their behaviors and their context as possible those kinds of questions you learn a ton about the product and the people that you're trying to support right and then the business is actually getting closer instead of just saying we need to have feature out by next month we got to hit this cube to goal because our investor is a a big billion dollar guy and he wants to see crazy numbers it's like all these other ideas in the startup space and i'm like we don't even know what problems we're trying to do there's four questions there's this four goals around with four questions that i love to work with startups on number 1 what is the problem and in, in human terms right not what is the b2b converting marketing set? no how do the people that we're trying to help and trying to learn from how do they define the problem i can't download netflix fast enough right that's a human problem the next question is does that problem exist your perception of it doesn't necessarily mean that it's true so you're looking for n equals 1 or existence proof this problem does exist somebody struggles to download netflix quickly as soon as you've identified a problem exists your next question has to be problems in scale how many people say struggle to download netflix quickly and then on top of that instead of magnitude looking at frequency how many times a day is one person with this problem experience said problem most startups don't know any of these questions they know they want to build something they don't they think it's a problem then they test and they're like nobody wants this feature yeah it wasn't a real problem and at the end you want to always ask with your startup through testing ab testing whatever you want does your solution your product your feature your service whatever does it address that human problem back at the top we created a uh, lo-fi way to download netflix and it can work in background uh data so it can download slowly over time does that express i can't download netflix quickly not maybe not but it does help if i can download netflix maybe in low bandwidth areas right that kind of thinking and it's like most startups don't think about problem to solution they're just like features 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 
get more investors, get more funding. We're now doing raising next round of funding. And it's like, we don't even know what it is that we're trying to do. So research, when I say it helps you clarify what it is you're trying to win at. And it tells you how the people that you're trying to help, the person that you want to pay the credit card or sign up for account, what is it that they value? They don't care if your startup is dead in six months. They don't care if HR doesn't hit its hiring goals. They do not care. But they do care about being able to get that Netflix content in a simple, uh, enjoyable way. So speeding up, again, is a function of thinking, saying no, and then moving forward that, okay, people may want this feature, but is it important right now? Well, maybe research will help me decide that. No, move forward. Elimination and subtraction, though it is not talked about much because in a consumerist world, it's all about addition, what we can do. But at many points of time, what we shouldn't do or we what we won't do actually also saves us a lot of things. Like in investing, like many a times my inactivity has saved me money rather than me going and investing into something. So yeah. Right. Research offers like another path, a slightly more human, slightly more objective in some ways, more structured, more consistent more sustainable if you do it right. It's not necessarily a panacea. If you're selling used garbage, research is not going to help your startup. You're selling used garbage, bro. It's not going to work. But if your company is interested in learning and iteration, yes, research can help you move forward, move more quickly, and move with more confidence. I tell my stakeholders, especially those that are resistant, uh, and you, technically you're not supposed to guarantee what will happen because of research, because it's the process of discovery and curiosity that matters. But I tell them, we're going to do research. One of two things will happen. One, you will find out that you are right. That's got to feel good. You are correct. You see something in the data. You see something that are competitors, the people in this oversaturated market, some way of differentiating us. You are correct. And research has validated that. That is a huge high five, especially in the world drowning of data. When you find data that supports you, man, that way, that's amazing. Or conversely, you will get smarter. You will see the world differently. You will have 1%, one degree perspective shift on the problem or the solution or the market, whatever, and you will be able to discover fire before your competitors do through this process. Your goal with research for us is to be wrong now. We'd rather be wrong with 10 people and give them $50 in gift cards than launch, hire three new engineers, and do all this marketing for a feature and a product that nobody wants. So you get an ability to be humbled and get smarter, and then be like, why are we building this? You're saying, Vroom, we build this other thing, and it's a little bit slightly different. We can win. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm saying, because we've actually learned that this is significantly more important to our people. So you can either be confident, which is short term, <laughs> or you can get smarter and be like, wow, we're building something meaningful here. Absolutely. And then again, as you said, that you can be humbled or feel validated. And this is a thing with stakeholders, you know, uh, they are in their own stories and they want to be the hero. Of, like everyone wants to be the hero of the story. <laughs> yeah, but they want to be the hero of this feature that launch, things like that, that I have observed. And even I'm like that. But as a UX researcher, you, you're like someone who keeps everyone in check. And that can be stressful job because sometimes you're not sure how to say it that I think this is not working. The only time I would say, like, especially if you're new at a company, ask whatever question you want because mm -hmm. you're new and you don't know. Why do we make money like this? Mm -hmm. Why isn't that team involved? Why do we market? Why don't we do this thing? And people will be like, well, he's new. And then you'll find people, especially if the company is maybe not the best, stumble over to themselves like that's how we always do it or like oh you'll f you'll find out soon you'll learn over time and you're like this is i don't know but it's like some of these uncomfortable situations i have found myself in with stakeholders it makes you think and you're like i have empathy for you too stakeholder you're a user in some ways i'll give you the same dedication and patience and attention that i give to the 15 people i interviewed just yesterday mm -hmm. yeah absolutely so, Varun, this was a beautiful conversation, an amazing conversation. Thank you so much for your time, your ideas, and your learnings. Super great. Really love the questions. I appreciate being able to get on this show. 
I love what you're doing. I think you kind of recording your own growth, your own journey, because you're also a practicing researcher. I think this is a super smart idea. I really appreciate it. And I guess the last thing I'll say is once again, I'll just mention Fruitful is out. You can learn more about it at applebanana.org. You can go to the, the page on Fruitful, look at our digital library and toolkit. A ton of the ideas that we talked about here, listener, if you enjoyed it, they're coming directly from Fruitful. And then you can sit down with these ideas a little bit more in your own time. I'm excited. I'm very excited to see where